Hello, and welcome to another edition of Convict Inc. I am your host, Robert Rosso. Today is Mob Monday. Before any go any further, I'd like to thank you. I'm over 6,500 subscribers, and if you have not subscribed, please do so. If you like this video, please do so. And if you would share it with your family, friends, neighbors, enemies, it doesn't matter. I'd appreciate it. On the night of September 30th, 1987, a street guy by the name of Frank Ganji hooked up with a known drug addict named Phyllis Birdie. For two days, the two did what drug addicts do, partied, got high, had sex, had a good time. The only problem was Phyllis Birdie was wanted by Frank Ganji's boss, a guy by the name of Tommy Patera, who was a member of the Bonanno Kahn family. Tommy wanted Phyllis because he believed that Phyllis was directly responsible for the death of his girlfriend, Celeste Lapari. Lapari, I hope I said that right. Who Tommy was madly in love with. They say he, she was the only human being he was ever really affectionate with. The only problem with Celeste was, like Phyllis, she was a drug addict. One night when Phyllis and Celeste went out partying, the two did cocaine. In order to get some sleep, Celeste did a little heroin, and she never woke up. At that point, Tommy puts the word out, I want Phyllis. She's dead. And then a week or so later, actually it wasn't a week or so, it was sometime later within the month, Frank runs into Phyllis, and instead of calling his boss and saying, hey, I've got F Phyllis, goes out and parties with her. Well, fearful that his boss had found out that he was with Phyllis for two days because he had not contacted his boss, uh, the phone rings and there's Tommy on the other end of the line. Now, I will say right here that his voice was described in a couple documentaries I just watched as sounding like Mickey Mouse. One mob boss said that he sounded like Mickey Mouse. That's not true. He has a high pitched voice. Uh, we'll get into that later. Anyway. When Frank Ganji told Tommy that Phyllis was at the house, Tommy reportedly said, keep her there. And then he went to the house, shot her in the head, dismembered the body, and reportedly kept the head. Now, let's back up. Tommy Karate. Media reports will tell you, and I'm not gonna dispute, that Tommy Karate was bullied in junior high school. Uh, at some point, he became infatuated with martial arts, and as a teenager, began studying martial arts. He entered a karate tournament, got a scholarship, won the tournament, which included a scholarship to study in Japan for a year, study martial arts for a year. Uh, Tommy loved Japan, loved the culture, loved the people, loved the discipline of martial arts. When he returned from Japan, he ended up hanging around local bars that were frequented, frequented by mobsters. And so through this, Tommy ends up meeting some associates or some made members of the Bonanno crime family and ultimately becomes a made member. There's a book called The Butcher, which just totally degrades, just beats Tommy up. Uh, this is based on I believe members of the DEA or law enforcement's accounts of Tommy Karate. Uh, everything they do is just to demean him. Uh, his blue eye, with his blue gray eyes, sinister. I, I forgot how they just put it. I was just listening to it a minute ago. You had his, his grayish white skin because he was vampire-like and stayed out of, the, stayed asleep all day and out all night. Tommy doesn't like the sun. I will say that. How do I know? Because in 2007, at Butner FCI, I'm sorry, at Butner FMC, I met Tommy Karate. Now, up until that point, I knew nothing about Tommy's past. I've said it once and I'll say it again. And I realized that on Mob Monday, I just want to be clear that as a child growing up in Southern California, I didn't have any interest in organized crime. As an adult or as a teenager selling drugs, surfing, I had no desire or interest in the mafia. And as an adult who went to prison, even in federal prison, 
around members of organized crime, it, it wasn't, it was never really much to me. So I would hear about people, uh, met John Stanford, never knew who he was. Met Bobby Manet, never knew who he was. Hans Grodd, never, none of these people, never read anything about organized crime, was not infatuated with it, knew about John Gotti only because he put himself so far out there in the media. He chose to do that. So of course people heard about John Gotti, but again, if I was with John Gotti, it wouldn't have meant much. So when I meet Tommy Karate, um, I had already been through Leavenworth and Lewisburg and been around a lot, especially at Lewisburg, a lot of guys that were members of La Cosa Nostra. Um, so when I meet somebody who's a member of the mafia, uh, it was really no different than a member of, of the Serenos or the 18th Street Gang or the ABs or the Dirty White Boys or the AC. It's all basically the same. There's, there's nothing... Um, uh, special, I should say, about meeting these people. That's the way I considered it. I judge people on how they treat me or how I am to them. Or, you know, if I'm in my dope fiend manus, you know, what can I get from them or what what can they get from me to make money to get high, whatever. At Butner Hospital, at this time, I was absolutely strung out on, on, uh, on pills. Um, I was running around with well, I was hanging out daily with Greg De Palma at this time. Uh, my days pretty much consisted of hanging out with Greg. Greg was an entertaining fellow uh, who also provided me with pills <laughs> and, and liked to take a few himself, uh, liked to smoke cigarettes. I had a cop on the take. I had the tobacco. Greg had pills. Some other guys, Greg's friends had pills. I take the pills. They'd smoke the tobacco. But, other, but nevertheless, uh, besides walking two hours a day in that hospital, pretty much all I did was hang out with Greg and, and the Italians that he associated with. I met Tommy Crotty through Greg De Palma. Nicest guy in the world. His voice, yes, high pitched. He absolutely has a voice that is, it doesn't match what he kind of looks like or his character. But to kind of Mickey Mouse and all that stuff, is just it's just putting the guy down for no reason. Um, what I know about Tommy Karate, okay, what I observed of Tommy Karate in the hospital was he was very disciplined about working out. He worked out in the daytime. Uh, matter of fact, he worked out constantly. He was in the hospital because he had a lump on the side of his throat, thought it was cancer, worried that it was cancer. Um, I, I, because I had cancer and had studied a lot about cancer, um, you know, w would talk to him about what this type of cancer that he had could mean. Uh, so we talked daily. But what really bonded us together was Jojo Russo, a capo for the Colombo crime family, also the nephew of Carmine Persico and son of Andrew Mush, or the fat man Mush, whatever they call Andrew these days. I've seen a bunch of different nicknames. Andrew Russo. Jojo and I had been friends at Leavenworth, for years, we had a little fallen out before I left over the way he treated um, a soldier in his family named Joe Monte, Joe Monteleone. Uh, but nevertheless, when JoJo showed up at Butner FMC with stage four renal cancer, all that was out the window and um, I ended up taking care of JoJo daily. Now, I've said this before and in full disclosure, the reason I became JoJo's ICP or inmate companion, inmate companion program is what it stood for, was because of a nurse. I had taken a fancy to a nurse, feeling was mutual, and for 17 days that JoJo was alive at Butner FMC, I was with JoJo. I went up to take care of JoJo at certain times of the day and would see my friend, the nurse. Also, who came with me in the evening after dinner would be Tommy. Now, Tommy would stay there with me for some hours. Him and JoJo knew each other. They would talk. Uh, but I had to change JoJo. I literally had changed his diaper at times, uh, gave him a sponge bath. Tommy was right there, not doing the same exact thing I do, but he was there supporting me, helping me in any kind of way. Um, far from somebody who I read about in the media. 
uh, rather than chopping up body parts or cutting the legs off of Jojo, he would help me remove his undergarments so I can help clean him. Again, ICPs bathe, change, they do all that stuff. Um, you know what, honestly, I probably would not have done it had I not been so high on, on pills. Uh, maybe I, I would like to think that maybe I would, I'm not sure, I can't say that because I wasn't sober at the time. I really was high. And Tommy did not discriminate or look down on me because he knew I was on pills. But he didn't look. He saw a different side of me. Um, he saw the side of me taking care of JoJo, whether I was doing it because I wanted to be around a nurse or because I was high. He just, I was into it, you know. Uh, it affected me. So seeing this guy die like that, a guy that I knew for five years, even if I had fallen out with him. But Tommy Patera was there every step of the way. Also, there was a day when... Jojo Russo, Greg De Palma, Sal Scalia, Fat Sal, uh, Matty the Horse, Philly Black, I think. Uh, there was a couple of different Italian guys, Mafia or Associates, and Tommy Crotty, who wanted to go outside for a little while and enjoy the sun. Now, Tommy didn't like the sun. That they, they have, have now read and just heard, I just got through listening to some documentary about his pasty grayish white skin. He didn't like being out in the sun, especially if he thought he had cancer. Last thing he wanted to do was go out in the sun. I never had a conversation with him about it, um, but he, he wasn't a sun guy for sure. When I went outside, I think I was pushing Jojo or pushing Greg, I'm not sure, but as soon as we got to where they were gonna sit, Sal turned to me and he said, "Hey." Why don't you do me a favor? Go stand over there and catch, make sure the basketballs don't come and hit us. In other words, I was being, he wanted me to be their bitch. Uh, you know, go away, California, white guy, gang member. This is mafia business, I, which I totally get, but it was, the, it was the way in which he said it that I didn't say F you, but I said F you by walking off and leaving them and walking away. Later, I complained to said something to Greg about, F Sal. I'd gotten into a fight for Sal as well uh, in uh, over a TV because he, he, he actually, he started the fight and uh, I had went and kind of cleaned it up. And uh, anyway, um, it was Tommy. Greg said something, but it was actually Tommy Patera who made Sal come and apologize to me and apologize Sal did. I have said before and I will say again, I said that too many times. I would let Tommy Patera babysit my grandchildren, my children if I happen to have any more. Uh, what media reports have said about him, I understand. Okay, they say he's one of the first mob guys in history that kept souvenirs from his victims. Does Is that uh, something normal, serial killers usually do? Of course it is. Do, does that change my opinion of Tommy? It does not. Recently, I had done a video about somebody who was dismembering bodies, not Joey Testa, another person at Leavenworth. Uh, and in the comment section, it was said that if you start dismembering bodies, it's almost like dressing a deer. Somebody who goes hunting, I'm in an area where there's a lot of hunters. I can't because I'm on probation. Uh, never was a hunter though. Uh, and I'm assuming, and I agree, I actually agree with that. It, it becomes business and you become desensitized to it. This isn't a human, it's just something you have to get done. Perhaps Tommy did take it a little bit more personally by media accounts, that's what I'm reading. And again, it, it wouldn't change the fact that I would let him stay here with me and my wife if he was granted compassionate release. And that's the truth. And that's again, based off how the guy treated me. I'm sure there's a lot of people that were, uh, if media reports are right, and there's more than the six people or he got convicted of, I'm sure there's a lot of family members that are that might not like him. Um, I apologize, uh, sorry for your loss. Uh, again, I had life without parole in federal prison. When you are a number in the feds, you are no different than this person, this person, and this person. So that's the way I viewed uh, view a lot of guys. Um, and again, Tommy Karate was uh, was amongst 
some of the guys that I met that I that I considered a true friend. Also, Tommy Crotty does not take pictures with too many people. A lot of these, a lot of mob guys, Vic Arena was one of them, loved to take photos. He liked, he enjoyed the, 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 the having that title in prison. Tommy did not. He came to me one day and asked to take photos with me. And I thought, uh, 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 actually, what I didn't really think about it too much when that happened. It wasn't until later years that I realized what a big deal that was. It was basically saying, hey, Robert, you're my friend, you know, and um, a friend I consider. Now, I've had family members, um, Tommy's ex-wife, A, a member of Tommy's, uh, of, of his ex-wife's family, of his ex-wife's family reach out to me. I don't want to say the person. And um, guy, just a great guy. Uh, really enjoy talking to him. Re uh, really just, just a pleasure to talk to. Through him, I'm try I was trying to interview Tommy. And um, I know a lot of you would have been disappointed with the interview because it was not going to be about killing. It was not going to be about mob. It was not going to be about mafia. It was going to be about Japan. It was going to be about karate. Um, maybe what he's doing in prison and stuff like that. Tommy declined. I was going to write him a letter and kind of shoot for it again. I decided not to at this point. Maybe I will. And uh, we'll see what happens in the future. But again, uh, more than likely he will not. So people have asked me to do something about Tommy Patera, and this is what I did. One more thing. There was talk in prison later on. I remember guys talking about allegedly Tommy took the head off of Phyllis Birdie. Um, again, he blamed Phyllis for the death of Celeste. And I understand why. If you've got a girlfriend that you love and she's an addict, and you're trying to keep her away from drugs, especially if you're a drug and you're involved, uh, if you're involved in, in organized crime or, or th that kind of life, you see what drugs have done to people. Uh, maybe you're a dealer and you see what drugs have done to people, but you're not actively using all it to whatever you, you want. And you're not a user. You don't want somebody you love to be hooked on drugs. Um, he had apparently warned the girl Phyllis many times to stay away from Celeste. She did not. Whether that was Celeste's fault, Phyllis's fault, it didn't matter in Tommy's mind. Celeste was his one true love. I don't mean nothing bad to his ex-wife, but apparently that's what it was. He never talked to me about Celeste, so in case people ask, he never talked to me about his ex-wife. Nothing, never said nothing about Phyllis Birdie. But there was an issue with the head. He kept the head, they said, and put it in a freezer. And there were people that rumors in prison that he used to take the head and talk to it and like, you know, see, I told you, you shouldn't have done that, you know, or maybe bring it out in front of people. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, again, he never spoke to me about the head. What to only thing Tommy ever asked me to do is he, like me, knew nothing about the internet. We knew nothing. We came to prison and never been online. He's never been online. So when you say that you can get, um, information on certain kind of martial arts, are you certain this or that? It's intriguing because it's it's kind of overwhelming for the mind when you've never seen it to know how much information is at your fingertips. It's still uh, overwhelming to me. And I've been out uh, just, it'll be 13 months here in a day or two on the 13th. So that's it. Happy Mob Monday.